Hello, I'm Vladimir Lore, and this is Master of Unlocking. So let me ask you, when's the last time a good survival horror came out? Well, there was Resident Evil 7, 2017, and that was fantastic! And then before that, there was, uh... Back in 1995? Back in 2016? Not really something that would satisfy the itch. Then you got band memories, and... That really feels like a classic survival horror, but... Who knows when it'll be done, the demo came out like... 2015. And then there was White Knight, which was also in 2015, although it took more from the PT school of walking around to solve puzzles and getting spooked by ghosts. I guess there was also The Evil Within 2014, but that was more like Resident Evil 4, and I feel like that's more of an action horror kind of game. But really, there was just fucking nothing for like a decade. Sure, there's been a flood of horror games of varying quality, but mostly nothing that plays like Resident Evil or Silent Hill. So what we do here is go back. I plan to play through all of the games I feel kind of fit into the subgenre of survival horror. I'm doing this as I want to make a game that could stand alongside the greats. And I think a good way to is to go back and play through these old games and figure out what made them tick. If for nothing else, than to emulate what once was. Starting, of course the original Resident Evil on the PlayStation. This game defined where it is to be a survival horror, it even coined the term. And though a lot of its mechanics were derived from Sweet Home, just like Doom, it's not really important who did it first, but who made it popular. So let's break it down. The things I think that make up these kind of games is management, exploration, atmosphere, and puzzles. So this game got a remake, which is better in pretty much every way. So why would you play this game now? Mostly for that sweet, savory cheese. You saved me! Yeah. That was close. Thanks, Barry. Don't mention it. What a monster. I can't believe... What the hell is this place anyway? The voice acting has this incredible, stilted... B-movie vibe, and it's really the best reason to go back and give the game a shot. Though I hear modders made it so you can replace the remake's voices over with the original, and seeing a clip of that, it's still just as good, but the improved visuals actually enhance the quality of the voiceover work, so it doesn't stand out quite as much. Other reasons to go back is that remake, while having a lot of the same qualities, is actually quite different than the original, and the differences are enough that each kind of feel like they're their own entity. Which is honestly how a remake of something should go. Finally, maybe you grew up with the game and you have hella nostalgia for it. Or you're just curious about where it all began. A big part of these games is item management. Which can range from Resident Evil's strict X amount of slots to Silent Hill's more infinite space. However, regardless of the amount of items one can hold, they still need to manage their resources so they don't end up in a fight that they just can't win. I gave this game a try on its normal setting as Jill. She gets 8 slots over Chris's 6. And with some careful thought about what I needed, I actually didn't have to do backtracking all that much for the item chest too often. But even without that, the game still kept me thinking about what I needed and when. Like, oh man, this room's just full of herbs. But I don't really need one right now, so I'll just leave a mental note and come back for it if I need it. I also never really felt like I didn't have enough ammo to take care of the enemies I wanted to. I was generally well stocked, but this was mostly due to me running around a lot of the early game zombies and only dealing with the ones in high traffic areas. With all this ammo, thankfully it stacks, the real issue became having enough slots to hold all my key items. Often it was fine, as you only need like 1 or 2 key items at any given time, but to unlock things past the mansion you need the 4 crests. Which is a lot of space in Jill's inventory. I can only imagine with Chris. Still, regardless of who you play, the item chest will probably play a big part in your journey if you like to pick up everything that you come across. Sometimes it's best to just leave a mental note and leave it there. Move on. Moving on the atmosphere. It's such a strange thing to define, as it's not really something that's rigid in definition. It's something that, when you feel it, you know, but the best to my understanding, a game's atmosphere is determined by the tone it sets, and how the game's aesthetics support that tone. Which is why a game like Resident Evil, even after so many years, can still be very atmospheric. All of its elements help to support the tone. The voice acting... Barry! While its cheese can offset the tone, 
the stilts delivery gives that off feeling that something just isn't quite right. The backgrounds always feel disconnected from the foreground. Traversing around enemies and hoping you don't catch them the wrong way and take damage. Even the music, which I'm told the director's cut was made worse than the original, but still works because it's off-putting. The movement system is something that a lot of people bash, but I think it's because they don't fully grasp the alternative, which is something other games would explore later, including the remake, remaster, but the idea is fixed camera angles don't lead well to positional based camera movement when the screen crosses over. There are some small workarounds of course, but why bother with all that nonsense when forward to make the character move works just as fine. I think the death system is the only aspect of the survival horror that helps the atmosphere while you're playing, but utterly breaks it once it happens. Cause nothing takes you out of the game like losing 30 minutes to a couple hours of play. It's about as immersion breaking as getting stuck on a puzzle. The puzzles in this game vary. As a kid at the ripe age of 5, I was too stupid to get much further than the first zombie you meet in the game, as I was used to games where you could just be the shit out of things. And I also remember how amazed I was when I finally saw someone get somewhere and meet Richard. Still, a lot of the puzzles are either extremely straightforward, put the chemical in the plant water, or obtuse and time consuming, mix a bunch of chemicals to put in the plant roots. Also another standard puzzle that gets thrown around a lot was push the block. This concept gets so much use all over the place. Push a block into the vent so you don't get gassed. Push a block onto a switch. Push the block onto an item to get high up. Push a block- HOLY SHIT! I know the remake really steps up its puzzle game, and being able to push blocks was probably really impressive back in 1996, but it's a shame there wasn't really much more variety in that type of puzzle. To say, the original Resident Evil's puzzles were a bit weak and lacking, but I think that's just fine because the best puzzle it has is the exploration of its environment. Now this is the thing I wanted to focus on, and the thing I really want to learn and research. How does the map unfurl? How much explorable space is there to the player at any given time? How do keys and puzzles open that space further? How well designed is the dungeon? So I colored in this map to show the space that the player would be able to get to at each section. Playing as Jill, you can see the whole first floor is essentially available from Go. Of course, some doors are one ways and need to be unlocked. Even with a pretty linear critical path, front loading so much of the mansion really makes the space feel bigger to new players than it actually is. Especially for those who haven't the slightest of where to go or what to collect. As limited inventory forces players to pick up many of the key items and end up backtracking to the chest. Unfortunately, I feel that the game doesn't have a lot of that interlocking level design that makes puzzle boxes interesting. The mansion is as close as the game gets, but even then things mostly unlock in chunks. You start in green, then move to yellow, which only has a few rooms to get some crests, and then orange unlocks, and that's just one room to get one crest, which you used to get to red, and that's a pretty big expansion, but it's a straight shot through the courtyard to the guardhouse, which barely has any exploring itself. You just need to steal keys from bees and follow the linear path. I do like how in the main mansion, single keys will unlock many rooms, as opposed to a lock key style of exploration where it's more linear and there's one key to one door. Of course, that's not to say it doesn't happen where a single key will unlock a single door, but it's seldom enough that it's hardly a bother. What this color map doesn't show is puzzles and how allowing the player several different puzzles at once can make them feel like they have agency in their exploration. To start, you have the crest puzzle, the plant puzzle, the portrait puzzle, a gem puzzle, and even some map puzzles. There is so much to do. Point being is that the game starts you with the most mansion available in a lot of puzzles, and it's full of monsters, even more so of Chris, and you haven't much ammo. It's probably the best part of the game. The mansion feels huge, mysterious, and overwhelming. But after finding the four crests, the game begins to descend in its diminishing returns, and the exploration part of the game never really feels as good as it does at the start. While the exploration never really feels as good as it does at the beginning of the game, the combat and monsters you find get a revitalizing shot to the arm when the hunters are introduced. Personally, I feel they're bullshit as they bum rush you and hit you hard and fast, a real punishment for players who didn't conserve ammo in the first half of the game. But they do add to the horror of the game. But they also add to the frustration. This game's ending system is kind of like the most obtuse puzzle. So in order for Jill to make Barry live, you have to wait for him to come back after dropping the rope. But there isn't really much indication to do so. Sure, Barry says, I'll go and get another rope. But it's like, how am I supposed to know that he would actually come back? I'm so used to games that don't function unless you actively progress forward. Well, I haven't played the remake in years, 
memory says that you get a proper choice in Barry's fate in the game, which is a great fix amongst many of the other things it does. Speaking of endings, I couldn't figure out how to activate the triggering system. The game usually would give you a clue on what you're missing to do so, but I tried before meeting Wesker, and after Wesker dies and you pick up his key, but I got nothing. I know the way Chris stayed back made it seem like you were going to do a boss fight on the roof, but I didn't get to, so... Whatever. All in all, the game has aged, but it's still a great play to kick that 90s nostalgia. It still feels pretty good, since other games in the genre play very similarly. An interesting thing I learned looking up info on this game was that they initially planned to make the game first person, but after one of the team members saw Alone in the Dark, they suggested the change, leaving us with the Resident Evil we know now. There were a few first person Resident Evil games on the PlayStation, but I never played those growing up, and I never heard great things about them. Still, it may be worth checking out during this run to see the kind of game Resident Evil could have been. Man, it's neat to see that Resident Evil 7 got to be the game they wanted to be back in the day. Anyways, next I'll be looking at Resident Evil 2. I played it once like a decade ago, but I'm excited to see how things change and improve from the original. Till then, stay creative.